evening and, and thank you for coming. There's stiff competition this evening with the uh, presentation of the Me Too uh, movement downstairs sponsored by the Women's Freedom Center. So there are a lot of people down there too. It's quite a lot of activity for a Wednesday night in a small town of 12,000 people. So thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Dave Scholes. I'm a member of the Compassionate Brattleboro Committee, uh, representing the select board on the committee. And uh, I'm the moderator this evening. Uh, we're going to be talking about compassion in the social services. I want to introduce our two uh, leaders, part leading participants, people who are deeply immersed in the social services. And we'll have a third uh, visitor, Mary Coogan, who's clinical supervisor for early intervention at the, the Prouty Center. Uh, Margaret, uh, Margaret Atkinson is Director of Development and Community Relations at the Prouty Center and Chloe Leary is the Executive Director. Mm -hmm. And if you read the paper, you've seen several articles, very valuable articles that she contributes on uh, the importance of preschool. So uh, in order to start, I think I'd like to have everyone introduce themselves. I set the chairs up like this so we would feel like we're in a conversation rather than a, a presentation and our guests won't be on, wouldn't be put on the spot. And I welcome you to uh, invite you to ask questions or comment on anything. Um, probably be best if people raise their hands just to, to, so we don't have to talk over anybody if that becomes an issue. Uh, so would you mind beginning, introduce yourself, just say a little bit about yourself and why you're here, you're, uh, why okay. compassion brings you out on the spring uh, My name is Sally. And I just came from Brattleboro. I lived here many years ago, and I have been living 30 years in France, and I decided to come back here. Wonderful. Welcome. Thanks for coming back. Welcome home. <laughs> uh, I'm Doug Cox, a uh, member of the West Brattleboro Quaker Worship Group, uh, and also the Compassion of Brattleboro uh, Committee. Uh, and it feels as though understanding and practicing compassion is the next step in my life, at least. So. Um, my name is Martha Ciprin. I've lived in Brattleboro for just two years. I guess I'm kind of interested in this topic because it's become kind of obvious that it's got to be a lot of top, top down. It's just not yeah. happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm Jack Lilly. I've lived in Dummerston 20 years. And I think that this is a great initiative and hopefully will help uh, solve some of the great disparities that we see in our country, bringing people together. That is great. I'm Jim Levinson, and I have the good fortune to be also part of Compassion at uh, Brattleboro with, with uh, Dave and uh, Sarah and Miriam and Ben and Doug. <laughs> uh, and who, which one is Chloe? I'm Chloe. I'm Dora Levinson's father. I just father. figured that out. I was like, oh, that's Dora's dad. Yay. <laughs> which greatly raises your stock. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. She's awesome. I'm Ben Copeland. I'm, uh, I've been in Brad World for 45 years. I've worked in human services uh, for more than 20 years with people who are homeless and people who are hungry and people with disabilities. And it's an area of great interest of mine. I have a, an organization called Northeastern Community Services in which I do advocacy work for individuals with disabilities, principally helping them get Social Security disability benefits and helping them manage their benefit once they are approved. Can we speak up a little bit? Some of us don't hear so good. <coughs> would you mind telling us your name and, and why you're here, please? Oh, yes. Yeah. yes. Oh, oh. You're next in line even though you're I didn't realize line. that you were going in the line. I'm Mark O'Neill and I'm just interested in the topic and in a, this whole series of topics actually. And Margo worked with William Sloan Coffin, who's a hero for a lot of us. Yes. I'm uh, Tom Zoff. Okay. I'm, uh, as far as my Vermont career is concerned, I lived in Dumerson until four and a half years ago. I moved to Brattleboro and uh, I can't seem to get away from Jim here because I met him about 50 years ago in India. 
but I, I, I serve on the board of Groundworks, and uh, I'm interested in this subject very much. Mm -hmm. My name is Kit Berry. I came here in 1965 and stayed. Um, I curate a free use, open to the public facility, a research archive, and uh, that archive has a lot to do with social history, 1800s straight through to tomorrow, and involves a lot of the topics that are going to be discussed. I'm Miriam Dror, and I'm a member of the Compassionate Brattleboro. Um, and I'm a member of that because of the topic that we take up and hear, especially in support of well, um, Chloe, and what I know about you and what you write and how you work and the rest of Winston Prouty, and I'm sorry I don't know the other two. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate your being here. I'm Sarah Bowen. I'm an artist living in Brattleboro. Uh, I'm also a member of the Compassionate Brattleboro group. Um, and I think I'm on a big learning curve, and I'm really pleased to be attending each of these programs. Uh, I'm Daniel Quip. I live here in town. Um, I work for SEVCA and I also work as a community organizer for Vermont Interfaith Action and I recently got elected to the Select Board. <laughs> uh, my name is Jennifer Jacobs. I live here in town. I've lived here um, almost all of my life. And I, um, it's been really interesting to see the transformations the town's gone through, and I'm really interested in, in more about what's happening with Compassion at Brattleboro. So this is my first um, getting involved a little bit more than from reading about it and sidelines. Yeah. Graph uh, for work. I'm the uh, Agency of Human Services Field Services Director for the Brattleboro and Springfield District, so I work for the state uh, and the Agency of Human Services. Um, I live here in Brattleboro. I have two teenage daughters. Uh, I think my interest is really around uh, sort of almost less professional and more personal, but really around kind of how can we um, support kind of those the fundamental element of caring for one another. Um, my most of my career has been in nonprofit management, nonprofit service. So um, yeah, community engagement, civic engagement, how we take care of each other is vital. So yeah. So I'm um, Gary Graff. I'm a, a father um, and a clinician and clinical supervisor at HCRS, and I have to say I'm proud to be part of a town that's seeking to take the noun compassion and turn it into a verb. When I saw it as a headline um, on the front page of the Reformer, I thought, you know, how, what a good choice we made when we moved here. <laughs> Uh, my name is Bill Pearson. I moved to Brattleboro in 1978. Uh, worked at the Brattleboro Retreat for 10 years. Uh, youth services for about three years. Um, Landmark College for 12 years. Uh, I'm kind of retired, but I keep <laughs> myself very busy with all the stuff, all the stuff that's going on. Um, I've done several brown bag lunches on the subject of nature deficit disorder, uh, which is a very troubling phenomenon and could easily be addressed by the concept of compassion. I mean, it's not just fellow citizens and human beings and people crossing the border and all that stuff. No, and people addicted, no. We need to be compassionate about all of our s fellow species, and there are millions of them. And, uh, anyway. My name is Jin C. Bunker. I came here in 2004, so I'm a newbie. I live in Dummerston. Um, <laughs> my interest in compassion has more to do. I taught horseback riding for a long time. still do a little bit. And it took me a long time to learn that you do a lot better with horses if you don't try and make them do things. But if you work with them, then they, you develop a relationship with them. 
And so then I started trying out people, and it worked pretty well with people, too. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, I've reached an age where people will sometimes listen to me, and I will talk to people <laughs> and listen. And it really does help, because when you get angry at somebody, they get angry back. If you show sympathy, then they want to work with you. I'm Carol Corwin. And um, I live in West Brattleboro, and I've been there for 61 years on Meadowbrook Road. And I was a former kindergarten teacher, and over the years I have met many compassionate teachers. <laughs> best ones. Mm -hmm. They're the best ones. <laughs> the teachers will be here on uh, mm -hmm. May 22nd. Yes. <laughs> I'm Darlene LaPlante, and I've lived in this town for a long time. I've done a lot of volunteering, but I'm here to learn. And this is my son-in-law, David Scholes. Whoa. <laughs> this is my mother-in-law, <laughs> And this is her daughter, my wife's kindergarten teacher. Oh. <laughs> oh, wow. And this is Mary Coogan. I'm Mary Coogan. Yes. I apologize for being late. I was coming from Thanks a team for from something. So. I'm, it's wonderful to be here. I work in early intervention at the Winston Prouty Center. I've been there since 2000, yeah, 2000. Um, I've been a touch points practitioner since 2001. I became a facilitator in the practice. My background is I was a pediatric physical therapist working with families and I was sort of frustrated because I knew, especially with the young ones with developmental disabilities, that I got so much more out of them when it was the families and the teachers who could tell me who the child was. They didn't need an expert to introduce them to their baby. Um, and this approach to learning about how to come alongside families and teachers was just transformative. So this touch points approach, yeah, we'll, we'll be talking about. But it's an approach that we've been using that um, that means a lot to me, and um, and we are embedding it throughout the Lisa Prouty Center. So it's a privilege to be here. And, uh, Scott and Howard just came in. I wonder, gentlemen, would you introduce yourselves and say a little about why you are here. Uh, hello, good evening. My name is Scott. I apologize for being late, but I was downstairs wondering where. <laughs> How come nobody's talking about compassion? Uh, well, they must have been. Until Star told me that I was in the wrong place, so uh, my apologies. I'm the minister of the Center Congregational Church. I've encouraged many of my members uh, to come to this forum, which I see many have, so I'm thrilled with that. They're on time, I wasn't. Um, and also, uh, I serve with uh, Jim and Doug and others to help organize these. So. I like to see the, the fruits of uh, primarily their labors and my assistance. And I'm Howard Burrows. I was just elected to another three-year term as a trustee here at the library. Great. And I'm really looking for a way to use the new library mm -hmm. to be more engaging and supporting for all sorts of things like this. And, and we do quite a lot already, I think. So I'm Margaret Atkinson. Um, I'm the Director of Development and Community Relations at uh, Winston Prouty, and I've been there less than two years. Um, I've had a long uh, career in various compassion-based activities, um, uh, working on affordable housing, working in the humane movement with animals. Um, I volunteered as a uh, someone who's really interested in education and children uh, here in the town for many years. And uh, I think I was intrigued by this opportunity because the whole conversation of, of uh, I think it un the process that you're going through having these conversations is really gonna uncover some things that we already know about our town and, um, and I think also uh, help this community to appreciate itself and also to move forward in a really positive way. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, great, and I'm Chloe. I'm the director of the Winston Prouty Center. I've been there for 12 years in July. Um, and uh, before, I, I worked at the retreat. I think everybody in Brattleboro probably worked at the retreat <laughs> at one time. I worked at the co-op, you know. Um, but I also worked in the field of developmental disabilities in New Hampshire. 
for many years, and so the human service part of um, my work um, has been most of my sort of grown-up career. So, um, and I. I really appreciate the opportunity and that David asked us to participate in this conversation. I think it's a pretty exciting conversation and hearing all of your reasons for being here is even more sort of inspiring. So thanks for taking the time to do introductions. And I just want to note, like we are one agency in this town that does work and we work with a lot of other agencies. I think that that's one of the things that I love about Brattleboro is we work with Groundworks and Sevca and HCRS and the hospital and the pediatric offices and the OB office. So, I feel pretty connected and we are still just one agency so my sense is that this is the beginning of, of a conversation and we can contribute what we have to contribute in a perspective that we work from um, but I hope that we keep deepening the conversation as a community and get lots of people's perspectives so I just want to sort of note that um, put a pin in that for us um, and so when we were thinking about how to approach the conversation there are, I think there are lots of different buckets in human services right now that people talk about compassion and social service and um, sort of what motivates the work why are we doing what we do um, and how do we stay healthy in it so um, I think one of the primary things that um, we want to share with you is our relational framework that keeps us compassionate and sane in a world where we're dealing with some pretty hard things I mean Mary has wonderful stories about homes that she goes into and families and situations she's encountered that um, you know it's hard to know what to do and I'm sure all of you have too in your work how do you um, sort of look at the margins of our world and figure out how to help so um, we have a, a framework that we work in called touch points which I think we would like to share with you as a way of sort of how we hold on to our compassion and I just want to note that um, I was in a meeting earlier today um, actually with Sue and um, we were talking about this idea of a resilient community or building flourishing communities and I think this is all connected that be understanding different frameworks for um, how where people are coming from that that perspective taking so there's a phrase trauma-informed practice or being aware of people's trauma as a way to know how to engage so I just there are lots of different frameworks and I don't um, I, I, I guess, I, again, I just want to keep the conversation, I want to note them, we can, I don't think we can talk about them all tonight, but just to note that, um, that, that those are out there and lots of people are talking about them, so um, just as a frame of reference. So um, I think that, so the, the Prouty Center, a lot of people think we just provide child care. Uh, we don't. We provide child care to about 60 kids in the community, birth to age five. And then, um, and it's inclusive, so that's one of our foundational, um, that's part of the foundation of the Prouty Center, and it's one of our core values is inclusion. And what that means is everybody belongs. All the kids belong, all the staff belong, all the families belong, that people belong wherever they are. And I think that that's true of our community too. And that seems like a foundational part of compassion is if we start with the premise that we should all belong and we figure out a way to make it work, then that's, then that's where we go from. So. Um, over the years, what I think happened is Prouty realized you have to hold the family with young children. You can't just work with young kids, and Mary referred to this. You have to work with children in the context of their families. Parents and families are their first and most important teacher, and that doesn't mean parents have everything they need. Clearly, I don't know how many of you are parents, but I can't believe they let me go home with my kids sometimes. <laughs> like, what, you don't have a book for me? I mean, there are lots of books. So um, understanding that um, people sort of have holding the child in the context of the family and thinking of how to do that expanded our services to home visiting uh, mm -hmm. we provide maternal to child health nursing to families we um, provide early childhood family mental health services in conjunction with HCRS uh, we provide early intervention which is working with children zero to three with a developmental delay or at risk of one um, and then when we merged with Wyndham Child Care a couple years ago, we added a whole other set of services to families. Um, and we probably touch 600 families in the community in a year, mm -hmm. like over the course of a year. So it's not just child care. We're doing a whole bunch of work, going into a whole bunch of homes of people who, we have a housing program where we, we don't provide housing, but we provide case management for families who are experiencing homelessness. So we touch a broad array of services. So that's important for you to know that we're not just speaking from um, child care perspective or early education um, and so um, we several years ago the state of Vermont um, committed to a framework of helping providers um, 
figure out how to engage with families in a way that was respectful and, um, and gave practitioners tools for doing their jobs. Um, without a script per se, but just how do you, I, this is a big term, I don't know how many you know, like family engagement, how do you get families <laughs> to engage, like it uh, sounds a little, but it's really how do you join families and people and uh, come alongside, as Mary said, and um, figure out how to do your work. So you can't do things to people. Was it you, Jensi, who said, if you try to make a horse do something, they're not, it's true of all of us, <laughs> right? How do you respectfully engage with people in a way that you're a person, I'm a person, we're here to do something. You might have something, I might be able to help, or you know, whatever those things are, but not let's do things to people to make them better. So that's, I would say, another part of our foundational practice. We don't do things to people, including children, and we don't do things to families, and we don't expect them to do something, oh, you'll be a good parent when you do this. It's we have some resources. I'm observing this thing. How can we help? So it's more of a conversation, I think, in a way, or a partnership that um, we end up being more successful and keeps us healthy when we run into situations where we might have to call family services because a child is not safe in their home. That's mm -hmm. a really hard thing to do. You work with a family, you're really close to them, and you feel like you're making progress, and then something really hard happens, and you might have to call and say, this kid's not safe. So how do you do that work uh, in a way that keeps you sane and compassionate because uh, there are definitely um, times you know and I've witnessed it in, in social services where I think people are like oh that family oh well, they'll never call me back you just give up on people I think sometimes and so this is our another one of our core values so inclusion persistence is another one of our core values where people get to mess up they get to, uh, you know, we all get to mess up and we're going to keep trying and believing in people. And this is a fine line, not in a codependent way, like I'll keep trying, but like, are, am I still helping and how can I engage? And if somebody walks away from services and then comes back three months later and is ready, we're ready to. We're going to be open to that. We're not going to say, well, last time, you know, we did this thing. It's constantly being available. And again, touch points as a relational framework, which we'll talk about is a way to stay healthy in that. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it is really hard work. People talk about secondary trauma. So practitioners and there are um, mental health clinicians in the room who could speak to this way more than I could. But that when you're um, working with family and, and, and two generational trauma, so we might have kids who are experiencing trauma, guess what? Their family did too. And so that trauma-informed practice and figuring out like, oh, right, the parent, and family in the situation is probably impacted and how do I hold that whole piece? So, um, so that's uh, sort of when we turn to um, a, a framework based on relationship that helps us uh, stay in the work and stay engaged and invite people to be part of the process with us. Uh, is that a fair summary of sort of? I think it's wonderful. The only thing, there are two other values that we hold at the Winston Prouty Center. And one is learning, and a hallmark of this approach is I may have a lot of developmental information, and I know the culture I come from, but every single family has its own culture. So I can only support them when I understand that. Like our goal, touch points, allows us. It's a different kind of model in that rather than me impose my culture, my, my culture on you or the culture of systems, three strikes, you're out, you don't show up three times, we're gonna kick you out. Rather, th that may not mean anything to the family I'm working with, because an emergency came up that morning, their car broke down, you know, all sorts of good reasons. Um, so, in terms of learning, it's that idea of curiosity, mm -hmm. of really saying, entering their system of care around their child, or their system, their family culture. I. I can only support them when I know what they're working with, you know, their system. So there's that learning and that sense of learning and curiosity that we bring as being touch points clinicians to every single family we meet and every single colleague we meet. I work not just in homes, but in every single, wherever kids are found, in every single classroom with grandmas in Walmart. You'll see me in Price Chopper with a kid in a basket talking to the uncle who's doing shopping that afternoon. But it's really to find out the meaning they're making out of how their life is going before I can offer 
any kind of resources that might make sense to them. So that's learning. <coughs> I'm always learning. So I learn from every single family that I have met, and every single teacher, and every single grandma and foster family. Right now, I'm working with one child with a bio mom, a foster mom, and a couple of coaches and a teacher. <laughs> this little guy, he's worth it. He's worth all of them. But I have to enter all their cultures to know how best to help all of us keep our eye on him, um, which can be, touch points allows me to do that. The other one is collaboration. This idea that my role is to come alongside and come up with a shared understanding of what we're working on. It's their goals, not my goals. I might have an agenda of what I hope this child can do because we're working together, but it's really coming alongside them and problem solving with them and saying, well, this might work. And they'll say, no, that'll never work in my house because I'll never do that. I'm like, great, thank you for disagreeing with me because I could give you, you know, it's important. Now I've learned more about you and your house and I've learned more about the child. So touch points again, it's an approach to learning more and forming really genuine collaborations. I do not want to show up with a list of things, a user manual for your family, because um, what is that teaching them? I don't think you can do it. I think you need an expert. When you come alongside, you teach them something else. It's like, I don't know. Tell me more. I'm here. And it's not even about solving anything half the time. It's just joining them where they are, you know, and learning about it. My idea of a fix is not their idea of a fix, you know, and how, talk about lack of compassion. I'm here to fix you. You know, I hope they shut the door. <laughs> you know, no, seriously, I hope they do. That's not compassionate. That's not, um, so this is an approach like yoga, <laughs> like meditation. It's a way of being that allows you, I think, in my experience, and it keeps me healthy too. When something doesn't work, the approach actually loves that because that mismatch is an opportunity to repair, and frequently the relationship is deeper. You know, I might get um, a real passionate response, and we'll talk about some of those things. Like, it'll be like, wait a minute, you're really mad at me, and I don't understand it. It's important I know, so that I have to understand because it's important to you, clearly. That's a whole different energy that I take away because that leaves room for, and I'm the one who didn't understand. And I don't feel, um, in the past, I might have felt unsuccessful as a provider. And that is not healthy to feel that way. Uh, now I say, I blew it that time. <laughs> you know, like, what? tell me what I'm not getting. It's a whole different uh, approach. So. That's just sort of a teaser of it. But, but we got all four of our values, which is the important thing. Yeah. And they're all very real. And I think being touch points practitioners helps us realize them truly. Um, and so <laughs> touch points is a three day training. We can't do it now or here. <laughs> and the Brazelton Touch Point Center would not allow us to. I do have a, um, a card. I don't think I have enough for everybody, so maybe you could share. Um, but it's a, I'll just give you the background that a pediatrician in Boston, T. Barry Brazelton, Brazelton, was it Brazel or Brazel? You know, Brazelton. Brazelton. Yeah. Um, and it's out of, I think it's now housed in the um, Harvard Center for the Developing Child. So it's an evidence-based practice of family engagement using values, uh, principles and assumptions to do the work that Mary talks about. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a real thing. <laughs> and. Um, and he just passed away last year at the age of 100, actually. So. Uh, a couple of months before his 100th birthday. <laughs> so, and I went to his party. We had a party anyway, <laughs> even to celebrate him, yeah. because it was wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just going to pass these out. So the card that we're passing out um, shows the, the guiding principles and the assumptions that we take on as we approach our work, and again, to stay present and compassionate in, in working with some really hard situations. And I'll just, I'll, I'll remind us, these actually work with all relationships. So we, there have been many times we've done the training at work and somebody says, I tried this at home. It was so great. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it's a, that's what makes it robust is um, as a relational framework, it works for all relationships and it's not a script about say this and this will happen. Mm -hmm. Do this and this will happen. It's take on this assumption, try out this principle, and see how, how it works. 
So, so when we think about the assumptions, for example, I'll give you an example of a family I'm working with right now. Um, they, the mother has had seven children. Five were removed, placed in custody. She had a significant um, substance abuse issue. She's been clean for about four years now. She has two children now, a two-year-old and a one-year-old. And she's living in um, really substandard housing. They don't have running water, but there's a trailer next door that they can use the bathroom and clean things up. Um, and she's really wanting to be successful this time. She's had a hard time accessing services. She's living in fear every day that these children will also be removed. Yeah. I came to her knowing all this, knowing that substance issues, children lost, she's, had, she's been very traumatized, she's very distrustful of services, she's pushed people out before, she doesn't want anything to happen. So I put on touch points assumptions. And we can speak of them, as Chloe said, not just about family and children, but all people are doing the best they can. That's one of the assumptions. People do not have to prove this to us. This is compassion, right? No one has to prove to me. All learning, you know, all parenting is a process of trial and error. Every single parent in this room will shake their heads. All parents have ambivalent feelings. All parents want to do best by their child, and all parents have something critical to share. This is true of every colleague I work with, too, you know, and every teacher, uh, everyone. And we can come in with a lot of information or even bad experience with that person before. I've had a few families that I've had a tough time with before. But I can come back to them, and I can take on, my attitude is, okay, we got this. You know, I am here. The guiding principles are what we do. So again, it gives us a framework. So a guiding principle might be, I'm going to value my relationship with you. You have important information for me. You want me, I'm here because you want me to support your child, but I can't do it without the information you have. So I value my relationship. I will be respectful with you. I'm going to help you problem solve. We are going to figure out what is it you need to support your child's development. Tell me what that is. So again, it's that curiosity, that openness, that really, and I trust this process. I'm making it, I'm always, always surprised. So we were talking about some things. The mother was really concerned. He's been really sick a lot. Both children were really sick. They both have developmental delays. Um, and they are concerned. The family is truly concerned. So then we got somehow into this idea of, you know what, it's really important to wash hands before every meal. It's really important to eat at a table where you can keep the surface clean because the kid, well, the kids like to eat off the floor. They like to do, they put it over here, they carry it around. I'm like, huh, I wonder if that might be why. What do you think? I came in a week later, they had found uh, a water cooler, like a water machine that had hot and cold, like we have at the Prouty Center. They now have water, <laughs> you know, but they figured that out. They're like, well, we were worried, they told me. And I was, I have to say, I was uncomfortable with the idea when I was just talking to them about basic hygiene. I felt like, huh, they don't know this, so I'm just going to say, you know, some people find that washing hands is a good thing. Like, I felt kind of concerned about that. I was really worried about it. I'm like, I don't know if you've heard of this crazy thing called hand washing, but, but I was very concerned that I was imposing my culture on them. Well, they came back so excited, look what we found. Someone actually in the school, they had mentioned we don't have water, and so someone in the school, the, the preschool they were with, had this one they were going to throw out because they had gotten some new system. So um, they fill up that big thing. They go uh, into Marlboro to one of the, wheel, the things and they fill it up from the stream. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they bring it and they do that three times a week or something like that. How amazing is that? You know, it's like remarkable. But that's just one example of um, just um, valuing, I'm valuing the parent-child relationship. These kids love their parents and every opportunity I get, I'm like, he wants you to read the story, not me. And so they're just like, oh, he loved it. I read that story 10 times last night. I said it to them once. The kid's probably sick of the book by now. But, but uh, they're so excited about all they can do 
And I, I, I did not, I trusted them to tell me what they could do. And it's really made a huge difference. The son is now consistently attending preschool three days a week. That's all they could afford. And he loves it. They're thinking about the daughter to go to preschool, but they're not ready to give her up yet because she's only 14 months and she should be home with mom, which I love. And yeah, again, so it's just this idea. So the principal, I had to recognize what I was bringing that could interfere with relationship. You know, my judgments, my biases. I don't feel bad about those. I have them. I'm glad that I recognize them. Um, sometimes, you know, we have to do that to make sense of the world and we have to honor our own culture. But this makes me be intentional in analyzing what I might bring. This approach also allows me to, when I say something to someone and they respond differently than I expect, like they get angry at me, or they do exactly the opposite. I don't, I don't say, like if I go to a teacher, I say, oh, this is a great idea for circle time, and I come back the next week, and they're doing it the same way. Rather than me saying, well, what's the matter with them? I'm so, I know exactly what to do. I realize, uh-oh, I don't understand the culture of this, family, of this classroom. That was disrespectful of me. So I went to the teacher and I said, I've had these great ideas. Why didn't you say that's the stupidest thing I ever heard? It won't work with my classroom. Or I don't believe that. And I said, so we agreed to disagree. Because I said, thank you for disagreeing with me. Because now I know more about you. And you and I know how to support what you want. Tell me what I missed. And then we, able to, we were able to come up with something that was meaningful to them. I came alongside her. When I tried to impose it, it wasn't compassionate, it wasn't respectful. Um, but <coughs> using this approach to working with people, even when you get it wrong, it, wrong, even when there's a disconnect in a relationship, it's part of the process. I don't beat myself up for it. I'm like, uh-oh, I I, I'm curious. When someone doesn't respond the way I think, oh, I think this is what's going to happen, and I say it to them and they respond differently, I'm saying, wait a minute, tell me more. Tell me what I need to know. It's a different way of responding to uh, learning more about other people. And I, um, when I think of the social service system and uh, what are we trying to do, I think ultimately we're trying to build capacity in other people because the system's not all gonna be the answer forever. And so we think of building capacity in families and kids in each other as, as people. And so if I, um, you know, we believe it, that everybody has something to offer, that everybody belongs, that everybody has competence. And so our job is to build that capacity and confidence. And, that, and again, we can do it through partnership and collaboration of being curious and, and engaging, again, not with an agenda and a script beyond how do we partner, how do we come alongside. So I, when I, again, back out to the um, social service system and why this is working for us, if we're trying to build capacity in people in a, a compassionate way, this is what helps us do it, so. If it doesn't even begin to work, try something else. Uh-huh, <laughs> yeah. But, 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 use that opportunity to get more information mm -hmm. or about. Yeah. Well, would, something else might be trying to get more information. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Right, and be it's, curious. It's, it's right. the dialogue. Yeah. I, yeah. I think what's so valuable about this approach throughout you know, the entire agency is that it, it does, it because it's a continually learning process, you, the expectation that everybody is an expert on their thing and has to have all the mm -hmm. answers at every moment is just, it's just not part of this kind of model. So mm -hmm. it allows for continuous learning and it, it allows for mistakes, but it also leaves that there are, there are opportunities to uh, improve your relationships. And so it's, uh, I think it helps to stave off compassion fatigue in, and I would say that early childhood and the and animal welfare in my experience are probably <laughs> the two places where folks um, get very worn down by the emotional burdens of the work and I think that this fr framework and assumptions help bolster practitioners um, in that in the process. Would, would, would you say more about that because I don't think that I understand yet 
how for, how how do you avoid compassion fatigue? And to, to just just talk more about that process. Well, maybe it would be helpful to think about what is compassion fatigue. And actually, I'd be curious. Like mm -hmm. that is a phrase that gets thrown yeah. around a lot. So when we think of compassion fatigue, what, what is that? Or have, have, has anybody experienced it in this room? And what does it feel like? And what is it? In <laughs> my exposure, um, in terms of owning buildings, I owned Bushnell Block, which was the worst building in town, 95% alcoholic, and that was in my late 20s. Um, I only faced a gun once, but since then, um, uh, in July, I found a dead overdose 24-year-old in a bathroom. Um, I've been assaulted by a 70-year-old uh, tenant that is mentally mm -hmm. gone. Uh, another mentally gone 40-year-old tenant assaulted by her. Um, when the Women's Crisis Center first started, I was on their board of directors, so I had kind of mixed chop suey exposure to this. Mm -hmm. But recently, uh, since July in particular, um, I've been so exposed to this um, that I feel my boat sinking. Mm -hmm. um, I feel helpless, hopeless. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one realization that I've been aware of for a long time, and that is the exit one syndrome. And that is that because the social services have been so available in the state of Vermont, um, basically coming out of the spirit of the hippie new culture movement in the mid 60s, mm -hmm. Um, and particularly Brattleboro, there are so many social services available, we actually are attracting people to come here because they're easier to get here than in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, etc. Mm -hmm. So we end up with this an abnormally induced, inseminated something mm -hmm. population, and I'm feeling overcome by that. Mm -hmm. That seems like a pretty accurate description of compassion fatigue. Does that resonate with other folks? Mm -hmm. I think people mistake compassion for letting people do what they want. Yeah. I was mm -hmm. talking to, a, if I just be quickly, I was talking to a woman who teaches fifth grade, and she says the kids have been allowed, they, they are trying so hard not to be mean to the kids that they let them do anything they want. Mm -hmm. So they're not learning from it. It doesn't help. Right? And I think that, that you need, I think people need to understand the difference between being compassionate and being, let's letting people do whatever they want. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So just to get back to Doug's question of how does something like this help compassion fatigue, um, I think what, what we see is um, because you don't, um, it, it, and maybe it's a little different, you know, hearing Kit, what you're talking about um, might be a little different, but in the work of going into families' homes and lives, and if it's the, you know, this, this mom that Mary described who's already lost five kids, it would be really easy to go in there and say, well, you're going to lose these two too, so I don't even know what I'm doing in here. And this model says, okay, this mom wants to do the best by, by their child. So uh, the 40-year-old, I don't believe that the 40-year-old who attacked you want, wants to be that way. It uh, doesn't keep you safe. You have to keep yourself safe. So it's, it, it's, a, frame, it's a mindset and assumption like, I know people want to do the right thing. Um, they might not have the tools they need. I might or might not have something to offer, but I can join alongside and offer what I can. And if there's a point where you have to step away, you have to step away. It's not that it keeps you there no matter what. Like persistence does have a downside at some mm -hmm. point. But I think it's just, uh, you know, rather than taking it personally when somebody gets angry at you, you can say, huh, I wonder what I missed. I'm gonna be curious about that for now. Um, or I'm gonna try to figure out if there's something else to do. So I think it's a way that um, shifts the, the mindset to not bear the burden of, I don't have all the answers, I'm not the expert, I'm failing to, I can keep engaging for now with the, with these assumptions. And, and by valuing the relationship, you know, I. It's, we say it all the time, it sounds trite, but it is really all about relationships. It's the relationships we have with each other um, and with, with each other.
period, with each other in this room and with the people in our community. And so mm -hmm. a, a relational framework, I think, allows us to stay engaged in relationships. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, um, and, and there are certainly really hard things to imagine. Like, I don't know what to say to not feel helpless and hopeless. There is a lot out there. Um, but I think mm -hmm. things like this and coming together and talking about it, mm -hmm. I hope help. So it, it, it sounds as though it's having a framework and a system to understand what you're doing and also having colleagues. Oh, yes. That's absolutely. absolutely. Who, who yeah. have the same framework. Mm -hmm. You know, it's critical that everybody, that shared language is important. So when, um, uh, and not that we never complain. Like, of course, <laughs> we get really frustrated. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that family canceled on me again. I can't believe it. And everybody's like, oh, that is really frustrating. And then there can be a dialogue or a conversation. Somebody can ask questions like, huh, what do you think is going on for them? Or what else can you do? Or, um, or is it time to stop and back off? Maybe you're not helping anymore. Maybe you need to lose some space. So I think that shared <coughs> language is really important also. Well, what I'm hearing is just the intentionality too is a big piece of it. Absolutely. So when you're saying you know, like, what do you need to do instead of like doing the same old thing that we're used to doing, which is I think a big piece of compassion fatigue, you just keep doing the thing, mm -hmm. and you know, stop and think, is mm -hmm. doing the thing helping? Is mm -hmm. it helping me? Is it helping the person I'm trying to help? And so when you introduce this yeah. framework, it's like it, there's the intentionality is like woven throughout it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our agenda can interfere with the relationship. I mean, that's the big piece of it, too. So, and and some, not everybody's ready for relationship. Mm -hmm. And I do work with some families with significant mental health issues, um, significant histories of domestic violence, but also others with um, aggressive outbursts. And there have been times when um, it has, I have had to leave and that I've had to come back, <laughs> you know, because, and I, um, I have colleagues who, and in myself I've experienced this too, when you're working with someone with real significant mental health challenges, sometimes they are telling you things you know are not true. And it's easy to get, I mean, you're laughing, but it, right? It's really a hard, one of the hardest things for me as someone coming into these places um, is, I get angry when someone lies to me, you know? Like my reaction is, you know, my father told me, well, you can do anything Mary, but never lie to me. But this was also a value that I have. But the reality for this person in that moment, touch points allows me to say, they are the expert of their experience in this moment. This is true for them in this moment. I need to interact with them as, this, as if this is true. I may have a need to want to correct them, I say, no, I was here yesterday, I saw what happened. But, but touch points lets me say, wow, right now this is their reality. So I need to hold it. And I need to say, well, if that's the case, you know, what do we do next? Or, um, or there are times when I say, this is really important, but I'm not, I don't feel like I can help you today. I'm going to come back. Can I call you later? I'll come back tomorrow. I mean, I do that to protect myself when I'm feeling like unsafe. But for the most part, you know, these people with trauma too, you don't always know what the trigger is. And especially when you're talking about things like parenting, um, it can trigger during a conversation. And sometimes I just sit with it. I, I, one of the most powerful tools is use the behavior of the child or of the parent as your language. And I'll say to a parent, we were talking and you just hit that table twice. And I'm a little nervous, do you want me to leave? I went to a house with a man who's a vet and he has two young kids and he wanted me to work there but he was wearing a gun. And I don't come from Vermont and I wasn't used to that but he had it on as he was wearing it. And it was my very first visit, and I went in the house, and I said, well, I said, uh, I notice you're wearing a gun. I don't come from gun culture, but I know it's here in Vermont. Can you, know, can you explain to me, do you want me here first? Because I can go. I said, but if you don't want me here, explain to me how this is safe. You have two young kids. Just tell me what the, well, it's the safest place, and you know, uh, if it's not locked up, it's the safest place. He goes, do you want to go up and see my lock? I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. 
Um, but he explained to me that that was safe. I explained to him, it's just like, okay, I'm gonna have to get used to that. I'm a little uncomfortable. Um, and we developed this relationship. When I came, he would try to not have it. Uh, I noticed that after that, occasionally he would have it and he would just say, oh, I'm just leaving for work. I'm like, is that good too? You know, I don't know. <laughs> but again, but I was upfront with him from the beginning about my own, I noticed you're wearing this. Do you want me here? Do you not want me here? Is that what you're telling me? And he's like, no, 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 no. This is just what I, you know, this is what I do. Again, it was a different culture than my own. I didn't make the assumption that I was afraid, you know, I just told him about my own feeling and about his behavior. And he was really, this father worked with me really closely for a long time. He was the primary, when I was coming and we were talking about the child's development, supporting the child's development, he was, he was there more often than even mom was there. Both were very invested in the kid. So again, it allowed me not to make these assumptions and be really nervous. I trusted him over time, <laughs> but I was honest with him. Uh, and he wanted me to be comfortable. He went out of his way to make sure I don't have it on today. I'm like, that's okay, that's good. And I think that's a hard part about this uh, model is that we are asking people to show up as their genuine, authentic selves in this work. Mary just relayed a story of like that feels maybe like vulnerable to say to someone like this is how I'm feeling and but and it's a risky thing and it's, it's not for everybody you know this is a um, <laughs> something we have this phrase sometimes people will know if they've been touch pointed like no we don't touch no, point it's not something you do to people it's not something you do because we don't do things to people we do we are we are we can do um, we can act from ourselves so I just it is it's I guess I'm just realizing, listening to your story, that um, it we find that it does help people stay present and, and engaged. And I, it's a lot to ask people to show up. It, I, and I think that's true of, of even this conversation. Like, if we're going to be a compassionate community, we're going to ask people to show up in a way that maybe feels vulnerable and risky. And um, and that will be hard. And just because and people. Again, like so this to me, this framework, if I apply it uh, to this conversation, largely in Brattleboro, I think, I, I do think all people want to be, I'm going to take on that assumption. I'm going to assume that most people in Brattleboro want to be compassionate. 87% of the voters. <laughs> there you go. That's great. Yeah. Data to back it up. And so it's not always going to look to me like they want to be, like that's not very compassionate. Like when somebody stands up, I know there's so much around, um, you know, it's, uh, when somebody says, I can't believe all the people on the streets who keep approaching me for money. That doesn't sound very compassionate. But if we take on the assumption of, I know you want to try to make the community better. So how can I be curious with you about why you said that and how you're feeling rather than judging them, right? So right. These, yeah. these principles and assumptions actually apply to a whole bunch of conversations like that that help people show up. But it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's asking a lot, I think. I'd be interested to know why he felt he needed that gun. He was a vet. His big thing every summer is he goes for a month and he, um, they do camping and training and shooting things in woods. Like he's so excited to talk to me about it every time. He knit himself a, a vest out of like some metal, like, to, and he had to show me how he did that. This is uh, it's his passion. Did he wanted he? to share it with me. He talked to me about it, but I think he hmm. always did. I think he, that was. He, since he came home from the war, he always wore it. Did he, I haven't did asked he him ever more. get to the point where he could leave it somewhere else in front of you as respect to you? He would go upstairs usually. When I came, he wasn't wearing it, and he would always tell me, it's locked upstairs. <laughs> if he did have it on, he'd apologize and say, it's because I'm about to leave. And that's how, why I trusted him. I might have been a little more um, less trusting if he didn't hear me that first time and respond to it. I was going to say, what, what, what would you have done if he had just simply ignored yeah. you and how would you? And just wore it every time? Yeah. I would say the same thing. I'm still uncomfortable. <laughs> no, I, pro I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. It would be our relationship didn't change. I would, I would be curious about it. I say, are you sure you still want me here? Because I told you I'm uncomfortable with this. You know? I mean, it's just like if I go in a house and I'm allergic to their 
three cats, a parakeet, and there was a squirrel in the refrigerator. There was. <laughs> and I was really allergic, and I started to get like really congested. Once they saw that, you know, all the animals would at least be in another part of the house when I arrived. I mean, it's just like what people do. People are really, you know, they don't want to make you uncomfortable. If they were aggressive with me like that, I would say, I don't think you want me here. We could do it somewhere else. I would bring it up. And I think that that's that. So one of the, um, the, the use the behavior of the child as your language. So use the behavior of X as your language. So if the behavior is you continue to wear that gun. Can we talk like let's name that and create some shared understanding of what that means? Like that's that's it, again not a script, but what 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 assumption or principle might help me deal with the fact that you still haven't taken the gun off and how can we create a shared understanding about that? You know, and being willing to discuss things that go beyond your role is another one. I'm uncomfortable with this. I discussed that with them. You know, I didn't mind doing that. I didn't feel that was inappropriate. I felt like you need to know this about me because we're in relationship and we both have shared care for your children and you are here and that's why I'm here because you want me to look at this job with you. So I have yeah. something um, to put into this conversation about the, the gun um, and yourself, Mary. It made me start wondering about um, what I call survival strategies. The ways that people create safety around them are very different. So you if I may use you as an example, create safety by not having a gun in a way. I can't name it. But what I really want to get at is one important thing, it seems to me, in addition to culture, um, is to understand that people, teeny children, develop survival strategies in relation to the context that they've grown and in reaching compassionately to another we have to ask, what, what is this behavior telling us about how they survived and what was that environment like and what were the relationships like? And I think, I think it kind of relates to um, compassion. What do we call it, compassion? Um, fatigue, fatigue. fatigue, fatigue right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it seems to me sometimes as um, practitioners, we take on too much and we forget that you mentioned this, Chloe, that people have capacity, that they have resilience, they've survived in things. Mm -hmm. And one of the hardest things to do is to actually, actually change those survival strategies. Mm -hmm. And it's commendable when we do and mm -hmm. the other does too. One experience that I've had over and over again is people are surprised, they want me to go or they expect me to go because other people have left. Mm. Mm. I'm, I'll just tell you, it's countless. It doesn't take that long, but we have people of, of trauma, and they sometimes they feel owed for the damage they've had. I hear about that a lot. Uh, just the fact that someone's willing to sit in that with them a little bit um, is a privilege, I'll say that. Like, it really is very moving work, um, sometimes. But it is, it's hard for people to let those things down. And if you keep showing up, like, I get teased. <laughs> I don't stalk families, but if they don't, if they are canceling a lot, uh, I will still show up the next time. And because my assumption is, I know you're trying, and I think you can do it, and that's why I'm here. And that is the message that they have shared with me eventually over time. In some cases, uh, it's not always true, not everyone's ready for relationship. But if we are at the Prouty Center, you know, if we are here, and we say we are here when you're ready, um, I think that's important. We're always, we, we always talk about we want to invite, we do it with our children too. We don't impose on children. That's not learning, right? That's training. We invite and create this safe environment for them to learn. We're doing the same, we're trying with this approach, we're trying to do the same thing to invite families, mm -hmm. invite individuals, colleagues. We're inviting them to join us mm -hmm. and so I, I, yeah, I think that keeps, that feeds me too. I have a couple of, of 
I think just clarifying questions. That uh, uh, clearly, you know, Touchpoint provides a language and uh, a shared context that works very well for you as a as a uh, uh, as an organization and as a community of caregivers. Uh, uh, you also talk about uh, inclusion, where everyone within the community is, you know, has a place and is there. Do you use touchstone language uh, within not just your faculty and board, but also with the kids and with parents? Uh, and also, do you are you able to use this language and this concept? in your collegial relationships with other social service agencies in the Brattleboro area? I would say that um, we don't necessarily use the language this way, but we model it, So and, and everywhere. So with families, with kids, with each other, with our colleagues in the community. So if we're having a hard, and, and what's difficult is if you don't have the shared language with the colleagues, so let's say you're having difficulty teaming around a family with you know someone from another organization, Rather than get angry about how frustrating it is that they're not returning your calls, we incur, you know, we internally are able to say, hey, what? So what's happening? You know, rather than getting mad, applying some of the assumption. But we wouldn't call the the colleague who's never done touch points and say, so I want to value my relationship with you. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's that. So my hope is, I, can I imagine a world where everybody sort of has these concepts and it makes sense? Yes, but it's until sort of. Um, until that time, we just keep practicing it and hope that it sort of, you know, builds. In the classrooms, we have all our teachers, we are going to be touch points trained by the time we're done, and most of them have been. So how do children learn about relationships? They watch the adults in their environment, how they interact with each other. And people know who's been in any classroom. It's very hard sometimes the relationship between teacher and assistant teachers and someone will treat a child this way because they think they know better than that's over there. And now I'm seeing a shift in when, uh, when they are more supportive. Oh, that's curious. I might have done something differently. Tell me why you chose that. When I hear a teacher say that in front of a child, especially a two-year-old or a three-year-old, this is how they're learning about relationships. It's much more respectful than when, you know, it's very stressful. <laughs> Have you been, I'm not a classroom teacher because I could never handle that stress. When you're in that passionate place, it can be stressful and adults can be like, I need this and you cover this and it can be like that. It can shift, so they do get it. As mm -hmm. Chloe said, it goes down. We were also training the early Head Start teachers in our community. We've had, um, We've had a nurse practitioner from one of our local pediatrics um, programs take it. So we are we're in trying terms to of training. Spread the <laughs> we yeah, we're not trying to take over the world, but uh, it would be nice for our families to experience a shared language in the community to be held, you know, with this approach. So the Prouty Center is now the site coordinator for the touch points um, approach for the state. So uh, just came this year, so we have a lot to do. We have a lot to do. <laughs> we have a lot to do. And dealing so, with other agencies in the town, do you find a place where uh, they're the opposite of this, or that they that they they're not practicing these things, or they're not receptive? In other words, could you, if you look at the whole organization of the town, businesses, uh, police, just the whole fabric, are there places that you think this approach really needs to be? Uh, focused on or hmm. exposed. And would you listen? Out loud on the TV. Yeah. That's part of our, part of our <laughs> work plan. Oh, I think the thing that we're here to say is that this particular, so, you know, so I'll just say when you think about working with colleagues or outside, it's like, so someone's never calling you back and you're getting irritated because, you know, mm -hmm. it is very helpful to say, um, what am I bringing to this interaction? So am I, am I mad at this or am I mad about something else and to be intentional? And the other thing is, is that assumption that everybody is doing the best they can is a very um, powerful thing in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And I am not perfect at remembering that personally, but it's good to be, I think that when you're, all the problems of the world cannot be solved by <laughs> us or anyone alone, it's a, it's a group 
effort. And so the so this kind of intentionality, it, it helps to move that process along. So the other agency may not have the touch points language, but if we're starting from there, we can help. The, we're building our own relationship and our own effectiveness across the sectors. And so this and maybe those helps people relationships see. Relationships are, are interpersonal and not interagency. Well, I mean, the work is done by people. And yeah. so, um, mm -hmm. and so, and it's people working together to solve problems. So you may be representing this this entity or that entity, but it's really this is it's people. It's but that's a great point, I think, in terms of organizational culture. I mean, we talk about that. How do we make sure like we're committed to this? Everybody's trained in it. We're all at different places in it, and you know, and I sometimes I get a little judgy. I will say, like, could you try to play? You know, like, um, but that. So um, I, I don't. I think it is part of this conversation we're having as a community, though. That mm -hmm. what are these? Um, are there these sort of foundational principles and assumptions that will, whether it's this or, or something else, that we all can agree to work from? And if we all just did what Mark, if we all just really tried on for a year, everybody's doing the best they can. I think that would be amazing. Like mm -hmm. one simple thing. So I do think that there's a. Um, it is people, but we're operating like we're operating in systems and culture. And I think mm -hmm. we're this conversation, this large conversation that we're having in the town, seems to me to try, be trying to impact um, the, the the culture of our town. Who said bottom up? You guys. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I both and I think that but I think the energy has to come from those of us who care enough mm -hmm. to keep demanding it and create committees around compassion I and mean, that's how change will happen so but yeah so, and go ahead. I was just thinking we also have to be forgiving of ourselves I mean this everything all of this is built on trial and error when we blow it we have to stop beating ourselves up for that we're like huh I can do better than that you know, but uh, recognizing that's how we learn. You learn from your mistakes. That's how kids learn. That's how we learn. We learn from our mistakes. So making room for that forgiveness as a community is really important. We don't want, we can't be perfect. And if we're perfect all the time, people think, you know, we create this rigid culture. I think making room for that is also a big part of compassion, is being human. Mm -hmm. Kind of comes down to us being forgiving of everybody, mm -hmm. yourselves and the people mm -hmm. that maybe aren't getting it, and trying to figure out how you can help them, but not let yourself do what you like to do is to slap them. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay to feel like slapping them. Yeah. You just recognize it, and you yeah, don't let exactly. it interfere with the relationship. Exactly. So no one has to prove these things for you to put on the assumptions. You're just intentionally choosing to act from these assumptions and trusting that. Always learn. You never stop. See where you. I just was going to reflect that you know I work for the state of Vermont, and so uh, it, I think the um, the philosophical orientation that people have around scarcity or abundance it comes into play, and when you're seen as you know, the man, if you will, or, or somebody, an entity or an agency that is doling out something that someone has to be eligible for and be found to be worthy of, that relationship is already sort of lopsided. And so I'm in my role working hard and the state is working hard on a one agency model, particularly in the Agency of Human Services, where six huge departments, we're more than half of state government, that is committed to changing the culture so that there truly is a one agency perspective. And that's across Department of Corrections, Department of Mental Health, mm -hmm. Department of Health Access, Department of uh, Health, I said that already. There are lots of departments. Um, <laughs> children and families, you know, on and on and on and on. So it's an enormous undertaking, but I think having people in, the, in those positions that embrace that and are not, um, and are challenging this idea of scarcity that, we can only dole out so much because um, there's only so much that can be doled out and we've got to make sure that the people who are really worthy of the stuff get the stuff. That's not the way to approach human services and it's a hard tension and I'm new to the state so maybe I'll get fired after this but um, <laughs> maybe I won't be along for long, around for long but that's, that 
sort of internal kind of philosophical, the haves, the have nots, the givers, the takers, all of that tension shows up everywhere we are. That's in our life, that's in our work. And I think the more we can sort of, and it, maybe it's connected to compassion, but the more we can feel like there's enough for everybody. We have what we need. How do we make sure people get what they need? Regardless of the hoops and the, and the you know, all those sort of artificial barriers we put in the way, um, the more we can be in that space, I think the better off we're going to be. And it shows up again and again in panhandling and you know, on and on and on and on. If we see that if you need something, that means I'm gonna get less of something. If I give something to you, we're stuck, I think. Um, so that was a long-winded response, but there's a lot, you know, there's a lot connected to that. And if our systems are set up to sort of dole out and, and play these games of, of who gets and who doesn't get, I think we're, we're setting ourselves up for a challenge. I think also what's helpful about this framework too is that it allows um, and honors the fact that people know what they need. <coughs> they can they have agency around their own engagement, and so um, and that is so so you know Mary's thought several times about you know families who have you know decided that they're not ready to engage with her, and it, it, it's it, it's okay because it's okay. Um, and so we're allowed to keep trying, but people, I think that that inequality of the haves and the have-nots mm -hmm. and who's eligible and who's not eligible and how many, mm -hmm. I mean, it, um, on the service delivery side of things, it really um, sometimes ignores the, the agency of mm -hmm. you know, people to decide whether or not they want to be part of our system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, our systems need some radical rebuilding from the inside and to, to flatten those kind of So this, I think, helps with that. Mm -hmm. um, sort of going back to the idea of compassion fatigue, I, I work in one of the systems where I'm doling out um, sums of money in the form of um, oil or propane or wood. Um, and I think that one of the things that happens is that <coughs> your process in applications and the kind of work of doing that day in, day out, usually you're seeing somebody that's experiencing a crisis as well, you know. Um, and so you can kind of become detached. And I think, you know, a certain amount of detachment is healthy and good and boundaries, you know. Um, but you know you can fail to see that there's a there's a person there and, and I was kind of thinking about that in how some of the conversations we've had around um, Around people who are asking for money on the streets, you know, and, and you just kind of pointed out that people people know what they need and You know people ask for what they need um, And sometimes we assume that people on the street who are asking for money actually need something else and mm -hmm. you know um, and so we kind of we detach ourselves that way. We also kind of experience that fatigue of I'm being asked again, I'm being asked again. Um, and that, you know, detaches us, dehumanizes the other person somewhat. Um, and, you know, and sort of going back to something that was said about survival, you know, mm -hmm. maybe that's one of the ways that we, you know, we choose to kind of try and survive our day to day by, by detaching. And, you know, when I think about compassion in like the kind of Buddhist sense and the sort of loving kindness kind of practice, you know, that's that's like the opposite of detachment, right? It's um, it's kind of letting yourself feel, letting yourself kind of connect with other people. Um, all that to say that it's a, a daily challenge, right? And you know, I I guess I'm kind of interested in this work that this group of people are doing in terms of like how the work manifests itself out in the street beyond this conversation. Um. One of the things that, that, a couple of things I noticed, one is that um, it seems like your framework allows you to be really creative. It really feeds your creative approach to solutions, which does feed and help with that, uh, with, with the burnout. You've got this situation in front of you and you have to come up with something. You don't have the answer. You don't have the book. And the other point is that um, 
it's if I have this correct, and I think I do because I, I was complaining of, years ago when Margaret was the chair of the select the school board. <laughs> I was complaining about these agencies, and you send somebody, they go to one, and then they send them to the other, and they got all it's just all the things that you're so familiar with. And, and she said, "Well, you should go talk to Chloe Leary, the prize <laughs> because they're not doing it. They're actually bringing people together." And I think that um, thanks for figuring that out and taking that approach. And, and Sue, I have a feeling that you're just, they're going to make you the boss if you keep if you keep after it that way. <laughs> I will say, and, and I said it earlier, I, my experience of our town, and I think when I talk with um, people in other communities, uh, you know, up north who do the same work, there is a sense of collaboration in our, in our community that um, makes me hopeful when we have conversations like this, that it will translate to something external to hear that, um, that we realize no one of us can do this alone. There's no way that um, even the, the things that we provide to children and families, we, we can't do that in isolation or in our silo. Um, and the systems get in our way. So like f people get territorial when funding is on the table. Like that's scary. Um, and the more we can operate as um, a, one agency or a whole with the same, you know, with some, like knowing that we touch different pieces of the puzzle, but we hopefully can establish the same goal. And I think that that's sort of what you're talking about. Like, how do we get people on this, um, having the same, you know, uh, framework and goal, whatever you call it. Um, but we, yeah, we, it, there's just no way. It's too, it's too big for any one agency to do. And, and I think there's also an understanding that, that the work of collaboration on the agency level, you know, is real work. It's right. that, you know, there's the work of direct service, but there's this whole other level. And I think that, you know, we've in various, Winston Prouty in various ways has been working on, you know, how do we make the system better for families? How do we make things more seamless for family? And it, it takes, at and in a, in a time when there is not enough uh, money, mm -hmm. flat out money to go around to pay for the costs of doing this work. It, it can be sometimes really hard to collaborate well, but I think the, um, you know, we have some good tools, but I think, you know, the back with everybody doing their best, I think everybody has an interest in success for our communities and success for our families, and that's like the shared mm -hmm. thing that keeps you uh, working together, because we all want to make it, we, you know, we just want to live in a place where people have what they need, and that's, that's what gets you up in the morning, mm -hmm. you know. That and, you know, overthrowing the structure of capitalism or whatever else. <laughs> gets that's, you another, that's another, that's another, <laughs> that's, 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 that's a different committee. That's another committee. That's on the back side of the car. <laughs> Everybody has different things that get them up in the morning. Yeah. Start with the monopolies. And Start with the monopolies. Yeah. another point. When you learn how to add, after you learn how to add, you know how to add. That's the way it is. It's a fixed thing. But you do it when I do. Never is the same. It, you're learning all the time because every every problem you read you, you meet is different from, from the one before. I have been teaching horseback riding for 70 years, and I'm still learning. There are still I things that so people tell me that I didn't know. Yeah, and you can't just stop and say, "Okay, I know how to do this." And you have to <laughs> learn like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or questions or? Oh. And I just came across this metallic rule thing, where the golden rule is is dangerous, right? Because you sort of think that what you want is what they want, yeah. mm -hmm. and the platinum rule says to give them what they want. Mm -hmm. And it seems like neither one is is enough because sometimes in the library you know the community doesn't know what they need they don't know what they know and what they don't know and neither do we so we're kind of trying to grow together and technology has changed just so fast so much that uh you know how do you how do you figure it out so that you can know when to push and when to pull? Uh, just like Jen said, we don't You're know. Never done. And so 
being curious and asking questions and engaging with other people is our only answer. And I, you're right. Like, there's no, um, I don't know what the rule would be, but I, I like what the golden rule, the platinum rule. Like, uh, something's not comfortable there. There must be some other, you know, I don't know. But yeah, it, I think yeah. only by engaging in conversations like this with people who care about it in a way to move things forward. Like, it's, and that's a tricky thing, you know. People. Um, Back to the family engagement piece, like, or, or uh, the, you know, there's a really important um, nothing about us without us. So this this idea of anybody who's impacted or part of um, whatever's happening should be part of the conversation, or that's it, or it won't be a full conversation. And so, you know, inviting um, one family to represent all families on a panel about services that's not the answer. So how do we? Um, how do we have conversations that are inclusive um, that, because people don't, that one family needs what they need, right? So we don't always know what we need. And so it's like, it's almost like co-creation of things. Mm -hmm. like that, I, I come back to shared meaning or shared understanding, like what meaning do we make of this right now given what we know? Uh, and then how, what do we do next? And then, and then we'll learn something new and be like, oh, geez, <laughs> let's do something, you know, I think that, um, if we just ask people what they need, or just ask ourselves what we need, we're, it's just not going to get there. It's like, what do we need? I don't know what the question. Is. Maybe it's the tin rule. The tin. It's like a lot of different. Is tin a lot of different metals? Oh, tin. It's like collaboration. Like I don't know. What's tin made of? A little. A few things. A few things. But that idea that something surprising happens when you collaborate and have a dialogue. You know that it's something. It's interesting. I don't know whether I already said this, but. If it doesn't even begin to work, try something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I wouldn't want us to conclude without just sort of um, offering you not only um, our appreciation for doing what you do, but also um, have a strong, uh, hear a strong word of affirmation. Um, this, this Sunday, um, uh, I, the, I'll be preaching on the prodigal son, which is the story of the father who, who welcomes back the wayward son. And so much of that story is about um, resentment and, and compassion shown to someone who perhaps was not worthy of that compassion. And I, I have to admit, I really struggle. I'm often somewhat of a Pharisee. And, and someone, in order to have compassion, they that there must be merit involved or, or there must be worthiness involved. Mm -hmm. and, and listening to you, um, you're really challenging that, that ethic, I think, within me and, and within our community. Mm -hmm. And I think what's most important, and this is the affirmation part, so that's the appreciation, now mm -hmm. affirmation. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you deal with families, which, which inherently means you're, you're dealing with children. Um, and, and in many sense, with children, there is no worthy or unworthy. Um, there, there is no merit or, or, or unmerit, if, if that's a neologism. But, um, and you are investing um, in those children. Uh, and that has an exponential benefit that, to some extent, we can't even imagine. And that is so important to our community mm -hmm. and to our state and to our world. Um, so I, I just want you to, to feel affirmed uh, because I'm very, very grateful that you invest in, in those families and those children. Absolutely. Absolutely. I second everything you said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Go ahead. I think in terms of social work, it's very important to realize that there are two elements and to be aware of those two elements and constantly reevaluating per situation, per event, in balancing those two elements. And they are heart thinking and brain thinking. Mm -hmm. And keeping those two in the right ratio because if there's too much heart thinking injected into a social situation, all it does is perpetuate or make the situation worse. Mm -hmm. So that a lot of people don't realize that there are two zones of thinking mm -hmm. and that they have to be self-consciously used. Thank you. Thank you.
paid me me uh, be planning to to get into this but but uh, so far we've been talking and you've been talking and we've been learning a lot about the how about the how <coughs> the touch the touch points is giving just such a, a wonderful perspective on the how um, could you share with us any thoughts you have about the what uh, you know what would you like to see on the agenda of, of our select board? What would you, that isn't there? What would you like to see on the agenda of compassionate Brattleboro? What would you like to see in the budget that may not be there right now? Any thoughts about that? I think there are actually a lot of uh, a lot of the things that we talk about as a community are in, like we we're, we are identifying a lot of those important things. It's more like how do we? Um, so I, I, it's maybe a cop out. I come back to the how. How do they get processed and discussed? And where are the decisions made? And what are we prioritizing? So um, and who? You know, I think one of the really um, the things I grapple with is um, what, what part of the system do you have to pluck to make change happen? So I guess um, some awareness of systems and how they're interfacing and who's holding all of that. You know, we have, we have separate committees doing separate things and sort of the, the way we talk about agencies and the, you know, we're, we're, we are an organism and so I guess I, um, sort of broader understanding of the system and how it's functioning and some and some place or that holds some of that knowledge and knows that when you pluck this string on taxes you know it, it like there's some way to understand well that's going to affect this so mm -hmm. sort of but that's yeah. that's so amorphous I'm sorry it's like not a budget line sorry, item but like the system thinker of Brattleboro like I don't know <laughs> I, would, I would offer to I mean I think so Brattleboro is such a unique place and so the fact that there's a Committee on Compassion and these really rich discussions about it are, it's like why I love living here. But I also have to ask the question about, you know, you don't use a screwdriver to hammer a nail, right? And so I look at when you say, you know, what's on the agenda of the select board, I have to ask the question, is that the proper tool to be reaching the goals that we want to have as a community? There are, you know, definitely things that there's a purview of that work um, that, but I, so I think that just being um, really thoughtful about, you know, what is town government for? You know, and I think that there's definitely groups that have some very rich discussions about, you know, what is state government for and what's our national government for? It's like, right, all those things. Because, and that's, but that's just one tool to making people's lives better. We, we have other structures and we have other uh, relationships that people can be intentional around um, creating the vision of, of the kind of world we want to have. And so, um, so I guess I would say, make sure you're using the right tools. Um, uh, this is a very direct response to that and, and to that question is the um, you gave us a tool tonight that I just I just wrote down the town uh, on Saturday added ninety thousand dollars to a ten thousand dollar energy line and, and turned it into a sustainability uh, pro we're going to be developing a sustainability program and uh, the first thing I was thinking about is how do we get the f me and the four other guys that look just like me so well, one of them is in his thirties, but the rest of them look just like me. To look like this, and how to be inclusive. It's not about inviting one family, yeah. um, or one person of color, right. or one woman. Right. So um, we're, that work's going to be underway, and it's going to be uh, along these lines. It's going to be much broader than uh, how much fuel the trucks of the <coughs> public works are using. So um, thanks for the tip. <laughs> we'll be around for more. <laughs> Um, and just in terms of uh, in terms of systems thinking, uh, in systems thinking, if you change one thing, it begins to change the whole system. 
And so I think there's everyone in this room tonight can probably sit here and think of one thing mm -hmm. that they could do differently that could change the systems around them. I think this is an ideal group, just hearing what everybody wants to talk about. But uh, just that amount of change causes an infinitely greater change over time. Well, and it kind, of, it kind of spreads out. Yeah, what an excellent way to uh, conclude. I promise these people they wouldn't <laughs> have to be here past <laughs> eight. Just a second, please. Go. And um, I want to thank good. you. Thank you. Thank you. For uh, coming and, and um, all. allowing us to all sit here this evening with the better yeah. angels of our nation. Um, part, parting uh, piece. Uh, in July, I published and released a booklet on panhandling in Brattleboro. If you would like a copy of it, just speak to me after this meeting.